Um, just wanted to thank you all again for uh, signing up and joining us today. It looks like we got probably a record number compared to what we've had the last couple of weeks. So uh, that's a good thing. It looks like our group is growing here. Um, again, this is just an open forum for us to be able to share information during this pandemic, uh, really to uh, learn from each other, a uh, good opportunity to, uh, to share and uh, to meet up with other like wood carvers in a time of a pandemic when we can't get out and have classes and things like that. So appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, if you would, continue to share this opportunity with other people. Uh, we'd like to grow it. I think Larry said we could have up to like 150 people on a meeting at one time. Uh, the number that you use today will be the number going forward that we will use uh, to sign into this meeting. And again, we'll plan on having this every Saturday at three o'clock uh, with new presenters each week. Uh, so that'll be the plan. Um, if anybody has any questions or suggestions on better ways of doing things, feel free to reach out to myself or Tom Bate. He'll be on shortly. He's running behind a little bit, but uh, he and I are kind of the moderators for all this. We set up the, uh, the Instagram page and the Facebook page. And again, just wanted to take an opportunity. To thank you all for taking time out to, uh, to watch this. Um, today we have Sarah that's going to be presenting to us. Uh, she's taking a lot of time to uh, outweigh better ways to show information. And uh, she's going to talk a lot about painting today and carving and some of the things that she's been involved in. Uh, so at this time, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Sorry, I had to unmute me. Larry, did you get everybody muted? Probably I did. Muted, so. and okay. If they want to speak, then they can use the space bar, I believe, to, to speak. Okay, good to know. Um, okay, uh, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm Sarah. Uh, my, I guess, the name on Instagram is The Clever Carver. Uh, I've gotten asked why The Clever Carver. Um, a couple years ago when I wanted to start the Instagram account for carving, I was trying to come up with a clever name that went with carving. And after like two days, I couldn't come up with anything other than clever. So that's why it's The Clever Carver because I couldn't come up with anything more clever than that. Um, so I started carving in 2017. Um, I was going through a, a rough divorce and I was a new mom and not doing very good navigating life and I just needed a something to focus on and learn and I saw Doug Linker's Hillbilly and I thought that's really cool so I probably sent him about 50 uh, private messages asking him for some kind of a tip on how to carve a hillbilly and finally he posted one so that was my first carving um, and it's just kind of gone on from there. I've been like a, a hobbyist or a crafter pretty much my whole life. Like my earliest memories are watching my mom paint. Um, and I think I can attribute like 100% of anything I paint just because ever since I can remember, I've watched my mom paint, my grandma paint. Uh, our whole family is just crafters. So yeah, um, I'm a full-time single mom. I have a full-time job. I go to school and I carve in the 10 minutes that I'm not doing all those other things. So that's that's pretty much it. I've been blessed to have a couple of articles in Wood Carving Illustrated. Last uh, fall, they published a little booklet with the bear and the snail and the other things. I don't even remember. Anyway, so it's been really fun. There's probably some more things coming out this year. Um, so yeah, stay tuned because it's going to be really fun, really excited, and that's that. So um, I get a lot of questions about painting. Uh, how do I paint or what paint do I use or things like that. Um, I can, I have a couple of things that I can kind of paint while we're discussing things, um, but it's sort of the same concept as give a man a fish or teach him how to fish. So I can show you what I do. Um, if that's all you take from it, then that's cool. If you take that information and run with it, that's even better. There are a few um, like primary rules that you probably should understand if you want to improve your painting. Things like 
you know, if the light's coming in from this way, the shadows are on this side, if that makes sense. Um, so there are a few things that, you know, that you can do your homework to improve your skills. Um, but really, it just, it depends on how much time you want to put into it. I've had 36 years to figure out how to paint and then three years of carving. So it's just a fun to have, you know, the opportunity to put both of them together. It's been really fun. Um, so yeah, Blake, do you want to do any questions or do you want me to just start painting? What, what do you want this to do or where to go? Um, you just go ahead and do your presentation and uh, start your painting and stuff, and then we'll take questions at the end unless somebody raises their hand. Yeah, I mean, if you have questions as I'm going through, um, I thought, so I have this little bug. Let me turn this on, hold on. Um, hold on, y'all should be proud that I figured out how to do this. So uh, hold it. And... Snap, look at that. <laughs> so you're on my iPad and my laptop. Okay, yes. for a carver to get technical, be impressed. Thank you very much. All right, so I have a little bug and I have a flamingo. Um, Oh, I get questions about wire. What kind of wire do I use? Whatever's on sale at the craft store. So there's thicker stuff, there's thinner stuff. And this is going to be odd, so bear with me because my iPad's over there and my laptop's over there. So um, I thought because everybody asks about blending, shading, that we would do our little bug kind of an ombre. And then you can maybe see or if you have questions uh that way so we're gonna go from yellow to dark red you don't have to use all the colors um another thing that you want to do is get comfortable with colors the color spectrum the rainbow um how gradients work and that's really not something i can tell you as far as you know what colors blend into what just um one really good resource is pinterest um, Pinterest has color swatches, they have, um, you know, painting techniques, art techniques. So looking on Pinterest for even, um, what's the word, like carving ideas, you can search uh, concept art or character design and, you know, inspiration is great. Copying is awful, don't copy. Um, but just looking for inspiration that way, look at concept art. They also give you different angles of, um, of a character so you can see how things move. Okay, I don't know how well you can see this. We're lagging, where'd it go? Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Hey, I had a quick question, my name's Scott. Um, before you start painting, have you sealed this or put any boiled linseed oil on your carvings or anything? Uh, yes, I dipped them in boiled linseed oil. Um, oh, I put it over there. I just have a jar. Hang on. So, boiled linseed oil. Oh, there we go. Um, and then I just dip it and drain it. I don't let it soak or anything. And then it just sits while I get my paint ready. So, yes. Um, if you were on the meeting last week, we kind of talked about it. Um, I like the way that the wood takes the paint with the oil on it. It just changes, changes it a little bit. It makes it blend a little nicer. Um, it, it's a personal preference, I think. Um, I am self-taught in everything, so there's probably a better way to do stuff, but the way I do it is the way it works for me. I think Bob Hershey said last week, you can ask a hundred painters how they paint and you'll get 110 different answers. Um, so really you just, you, I can give you some tips and techniques, but the more time you put into it, the more you get out of it. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, that's just. Hey, yeah. Sarah. Yes. Do you find that the, um, 
the coating, the finish that you put on first, does that impact your blending of colors? And hello, by the way. Hi. Uh, it makes it easier in my opinion. I think the wood takes the paint a little bit better. There is kind of a, a fine line because acrylics are water-based and then obviously boiled linseed oil is oil. And so you don't want there to be any pooled oil on your carve or the paint will kind of bead a little bit. Um, and so you just make sure that like in any of the creases here that um, you've got the oil off, like it, it looks pretty much soaked in. But other than that, I mean, I like, I like the oil, not everybody does. I haven't tried other oils. I know people have talked about walnut oil, tongue oil, um, and things like that. I don't know. I've only used boiled linseed oil. But if it's not broke, don't fix it. All right. This hey, little guy. Sarah? Yeah. What's in the uh, syringe? Is that just water? It's just water. Um, I add just a couple of drops. Depending on what I'm going to be painting, um, I will thin it out a little bit. Um, with blending, I don't want it too watered down. But I usually have more, more water than paint. Um, just because that, I like the way that the wood takes it, but when it's watered down. Um, so I'll usually, before I start, I'll have little pencil marks of where things are. When I paint over it, it's usually covered, but. Uh, hey, Sarah. Yeah. This is Roger Stegall. Uh, yeah. Do you let your oil, linseed oil uh, dry first or you uh, paint on it uh, wet or short? It's still wet. It's damp there it's not um i probably dipped this about a quarter to one or quarter to whatever time you're in okay. a quarter to the hour um and then while i'm getting my paint ready i just let it sit on a paper towel and by the time i'm ready to paint if there's any left within the creases um i'll okay. wipe it off with a paper towel all right thanks mm -hmm. so i'll usually use if i'm blending it's a pretty good size round brush it's either a nine or a six. I'm not sure. Just a big fat round brush. Um, and then I'm going to go from light to dark. And if you work that way, then it's not super important to keep your water clean or your paint has to be separated. You're blending everything, so it's going to get messy anyway. And again, I'm not an authority on this. So if someone has a better way of doing it, <laughs> do it your way. This is just. Like I said, what works for me. Um, and there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, so as I'm painting, if you have questions, uh, it's a little odd for me to paint and talk and monitor two cameras. So please feel free to talk. Um, and I'll try to explain as I go along. It doesn't have to be super pretty at the beginning. You're gonna go back and detail the other areas when you're done. You know, like around the eyes or if you had any other details. This one doesn't have much detail, so it's not going to matter. When you're, when you're painting a figure like this, will you wait and do the eyes at the end instead of doing them at the beginning? I actually probably would have done them at the beginning, but I didn't wanna waste time. Um, but, because I'm blending the whole thing, um, at the end is probably better just in case you hit it with color, then it's not that big of an issue. So there are times where I won't even rinse my brush between two colors, just because it, it like I said, it really doesn't matter as you're blending. And you'll probably go over some areas two or three times, just to start. Now, hey, this is Richard, by the way. Um, do you normally paint your carvings with the wire in, or do you? Did you just do that for visual? I've, for had, I've had this one carved for a while, and I put the wire in for kicks and giggles because I wanted to see what it looked like. Most of the time, I won't glue it in until after it's painted, um, but the wire is thin and it will be easily wiped off. So. Um, Sarah, this is Bob Kay. Hi. Hey. 
just a quick question. I, I noticed, unless it was just the, the, the lighting, but your linseed oil appeared to be dark. I know linseed oil is light. Is, yeah. is that true or is it just the light? Um, does anyone know, is it burnt umber or raw umber Mike Shipley uses? It's in his oh, book. Okay. Burnt umber then. So you okay. have burnt umber in there then. I do. Just a little okay. bit. Um, it gives it a tint because okay. when, like if I'm doing a, a person or with flesh, um, that little bit of brown tone will enhance the skin tone. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. I use raw sienna in mine. So it, it was just, I think Mike Shipley's book with the bears was the first one that I had. A fir the first book. Is my thing frozen? All right. There we go. You'll have to tell me because I can't see the front side of it. All right. That's pretty quick. And is the lighting bad? Do you want me to close the shade? Anybody? Yeah, there's a little glare on it. It's hard to see. Hang on. See if that helps. Fancy. All right, I've got a question here for you guys. Um, you're, you're talking about... Uh, putting a tone of some sort in the uh, oil. Hey, what is that that you're putting in there exactly? Is that a paint or what is that? It's it oil-based paint. Yeah, it's like an oil paint. Um, Michael's, just the cheap stuff works great. Um, so I, I, with the shading or the ombre, I'll go back over the where the colors meet and try to pull, so like we had the red, the barn red, which is the second to darkest. I had it here. And then I went back and I took this orange, the darker orange, it's a, a poppy orange, and I pulled it down into the red. So it's just going back and forth and building on the color. The more you build on the color, the more seamless you'll find um, the transition, especially as it starts to dry. Um, so, let's see. Did you paint the main colors on first and then started blending them? I start with the lightest color and I'll start blending them immediately. Um, I, as I'm painting them on, I'll kind of pull the color into the previous color. Okay. Um, so I'll pull the darker into the lighter and then I'll go down a little bit and then I'll go back up and pull the lighter down into the darker. I don't know if that makes sense. Kind of going back and forth. As you layer the colors, um, you know, it, it kind of dries a little bit. You'll see it start to blend more and more. So it gets pretty seamless. Um, I rarely rinse my brush. I might add water to it um, just to help the paint, but I don't actually rinse it. Um. Hi, sweetheart. Hey, Sarah, this is uh, Richard Embling. Um, yeah. I'm just uh, got a question regarding the different brand paints you're using. Is there a reason for this, or is uh, just because it's the right color? Um, just because it's the right color. I so with acrylic. Um, Delta is a good quality, Folk Art is a good quality, Americana. I don't generally buy, um, like, Michael's brand. The only thing that I buy, like, the Craft Smart brand, this is the antiquing solution that I like. A lot of people have asked what antiquing. I haven't actually added this to a carving in quite a long time. When I first started, and I think this is a common misconception maybe, and I apologize if I offend anybody. Um, I think there's a confusion between shading for dimension and adding antiquing solution. Um, antiquing makes it look old, and if you add too much, it makes it look dirty. I don't love 
that. When I first started, that's what I used and I'll, you can water this down. You can still use this as a, a shading medium, um, water it down, you know, so that it's not quite so thick. Um, but as I've gone on, um, painting um, highlights and lowlights is kind of the same concept as um, mountain peaks and valleys. So if you think of a mountain range, the highest points of the mountain where the sun hits are the lightest parts. The valleys, the creases, um, is where you have your shadows and low lights. So if you look at a carving like, mount, like a mountain, anything that's a peak, so let's see if I can, so the peaks would be these high points. Those would be your lightest part and the creases would be where you wanted to add a darker color. So now instead of adding antiquing solution or antiquing wax, if I'm painting something orange, um, let's say I, I want, actually, I have a better idea. Let's go with Mr. Flamingo. Um, all right, we'll go with coral. So coral is kind of a lightish pink color. And deep sea coral, which is a slightly darker shade. Actually, I'm going to go one darker. All right, can you guys see these? So there's the main color. And then where I want to add depth, I'm going to go with a darker color. And it's a fairly easy concept, but this is one of those, you know, primary concepts that if you don't understand it, go read an art book. And it's, it's really kind of the basics of painting. Um, if I wanted to cover, uh, you know, flamingos are a pinkish color. So you would, a lot of people would look at that and be like, well, there's just, it's, there's not many. So it, it very small details will make a huge impact on the finished piece. So all the, the places where the wing is separated from the body or the, the space in between the feathers, that's where you would add the darker tone. Um, so shading is knowing how to take a lighter tone or your, your basic color and then finding a slightly darker shade to add that shadow. So we're gonna just give this guy or girl. Hey Sarah, um, two things, mm -hmm. your screen froze. Oh, but also, sorry, have, you, have you ever used just a, a watered down black to do the shading areas as well? No. Um, I, I, when I started, it was the antiquing wax, um, but probably the last several months since last fall, um, I've just started giving um, my carvings any kind of depth or character by adding other shades or tones or different tones, or if you have I don't know if you guys saw the the dragon. His body is painted with purple and I dry brushed, I think a midnight blue or a, a darker blue over it just to give him some dimension. All right. So, pink, yes, can you see? I don't even know if you can see. When I've done that, I'll take a small flat, um, a flat brush. That's even, it's flat. Instead of round, it's flat. Um, and I'll go in with that darker tone and just barely put, I don't even know where the freak my cameras are. Just on the tip. Um, and you can wipe it off a little. And then going in where those little creases are. And it's not a lot of paint, but you're just putting it right where the wing meets the body and then fan it out. And the same, just right where you've created that crevice. 
put it inside. And if you want more dimension, you can add even another darker color. Uh, you can go one more shade darker. Hold, please. Doing my best. Sarah, would you ever go back over top of the pink with maybe like a white to yes. lighten it up? So after it has dried, um, or mostly dry, uh, with either a very light pink or even a, an off-white, not necessarily white, I'll go back and dry brush over the whole flamingo um, to give it that highlight dimension. Because when you're dry brushing, you're hitting all of the high spots. You're carving marks and everything. Um, so all of your high points will get that light dry brush. So yes, absolutely. Can you see, I don't know where my camera is on this one. Mm -hmm. So you can see where there's just a little bit of that darker color around the wing. And those small details will, is what will make your carving pop. Um, if you spend two, three, four hours carving something and paint it in 20 minutes, then you have a really awesome carving and then it looks like you just painted the broad side of a barn. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but put as much time into the painting and the small details as you do into the carving. Um, it makes all the difference and it is very small details that will make it pop. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Sarah, Sarah can what you type of brush that? do you use for dry brushing? I use, I've heard it called many things. Um, a stipple brush, a smushing brush, um, gosh, a blending you're brush. Camera, Sarah, you're off what? camera. I'm off? Oh, I yeah. was, oh, sorry, holding on the wrong one. Um, it is, let's see if I can. So smooshing brush, blending brush, round brush. Um, I don't know. You. Uh, that's what it looks like. And that's what I use for dry brushing. So for those that don't know what dry brushing is, let's talk about that. So I'll go with vintage white over here. And can you guys see, I was holding it up to the wrong camera. So that bit of dark that we put in um, within the wing, I know the lighting's bad, I'm really sorry, but that's where you start to separate or give dimension to your carve. All right. Dry brushing means you're not gonna get your brush wet. You take a tiny dot, and I do mean tiny, it's just that itty bitty right there. You kind of dip your brush, but then give it a good bang most of the paint off the brush. Um, you don't want it to be loaded with a lot of paint. And then take your carve and very lightly go over it, the high spots. Um, I, I try to get most of the paint off of it. And if it's too much when you put it on, just brush it off. It works best when your carve is mostly dry um, so that the wet paint on the, and it's a little heavy. It is, there we go. Um, it will just add highlights and adds a third. So you have your base coat, you have your darker um, low light, and then you go back over it and you have <coughs> a highlight. It's, and it makes it look very dimensional. Sarah, do you always brush your carvings? Dry brush them? Mm -mm. It just depends on the desired look. So, um, I don't always water the paint down. Sometimes I water the paint down. I mean, it really, 
the, the more you paint and the more you become comfortable with how the paint reacts on the wood and how colors blend, what happens when either you add boiled linseed oil or you're carving on, um, you're carving on the, uh, the bare wood. It, it really just is a personal preference depending on your, your project. I don't, does that make sense? If that wood had lines in it, would you still be able to see it, Sarah? You sure? Um, like the grain? Yes. Yeah, the, it's still pretty, it's pretty thin. The paint is pretty thin. Um, so you can, you can still see the texture of the wood through the pink. Does that, is that what you're asking? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Someone else had a question. Quick question. Um, I was wondering if you apply various layers of paint to your carving. So if you let your carving uh, the paint dry and then apply another layer uh, later on afterwards. Um, yes and no. Um, as I'm painting, I'll work in sections. So I, it won't ever be to where like I paint it and I let it dry and then I come back later. I'll, I'll paint all of it together. So if I wanted um, to add, you know, like, if you can kind of start to see. Um, if I wanted to add darker dimension to the wing after I dry brush it, I'll probably move up and work on the face and then I'll go back to the wing after I'm done with that. But I try to get all of the painting done at one time, mostly because I don't have time to come back later. So, um, I've just found that if I work in sections, like on the bug, um, you can see he kind of blended up pretty nice. So it's just working from head to bum or top to bottom, light to dark. Uh, you know, you kind of figure out how you want the finished piece to look. With blending, it works really good to go from light to dark and get kind of that first coat on. And then you can go back and add, you know, if you wanted it to be more orange. So right now the bum is mostly red. I could go back and add kind of that medium orange I think the third color, um, go down and then pull it into that red so that then it's more orange, but it's blending seamlessly into the red. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Now, do you see anything special? I think it was that ceiling. Do I seal it? That the question? Yes. Yeah, that was the question. Yes. Okay, eight. sorry. It kind of it kind of cut out. Um, after it's all done and painted and um, dry, then I'll go in and uh, I I like the Krylon matte or satin finish. It it's I like the finish of that. Um, I have Howard's feed and wax, and it works pretty good. It's not my favorite. Um, I've just found that the I like the finished look of um, Krylon. I know that uh -huh. there's you. Deft and uh, I don't know, Blake, what did you use? I use Deft also, but you have to, it's hard to find now. A lot of times you just have to order it on Amazon. Uh, that's usually what I use though. Yeah. Sorry guys, are you guys referring to like clear lacquer? Cause I'm not sure what the brands are in the UK. Yeah, it's a spray, like a spray sealant that you would spray on wood. So like a spray paint can. And then oh, okay. there's like a matte finish, satin finish, glossy finish. Um, if you like your carving glossy, spray it with a glossy finish. Um, I, I don't particularly care for the high gloss. I like it more of a satin finish. So I use the matte or the satin Krylon or just that spray sealant. Well, well, there's also right, like a, right. Sure. There's I'm also sorry, a but... Rotolium brand that you can buy at Home Depot that's good. Krylon is a uh, is an acrylic finish, whereas Deft is a lacquer. There's actually a difference between the two. Okay. Thanks, Bob. So, Sarah, while we have you on uh, on the camera here, can you talk a little bit about this project <laughs> and then what all you <laughs> did to uh, come up with the the uh, carvings for this? and the process with uh, Wood Carving Illustrated, what all you went through to get that ready? 
Yes. Yes. Um, okay, so it's kind of a, it was all like a shot in the dark with Wood Carving Illustrated. I had posted, I think two years ago, I'd done these little penguins. It was a scene um, and it just had three easy little penguins on it. Um, I got several messages that said, hey, you know, you should send this into Wood Carving Illustrated. I had no idea how. So they gave me an email address. It's like editors at Wood Carving Illustrated. Um, and so I sent them an email and I said, I really have no idea what I'm doing, but I had a lot of people ask me to send this in to you guys. Um, and I attached a picture of the project. Um, I think it was probably two or three months later, I got an email response from uh, one of the editors at Wood Carving Illustrated and they said, hey, we really like these. Um, we'd love to you know, put it in the winter magazine. And so um, I, I had a couple few months and <coughs> did what that little penguin is. Um, I had to do the, you know, you take pictures of the step-by-step, -step, you write up the, um, the description or the, the details of what you do in each step. And so I sent that in, I think it was in like June maybe of last year. Uh, so I sent that in. After that, um, a few months after that, I got another email from the, the editor and she asked if they could see some of my other um, projects. And I had done the little bear with the balloon for my daughter. And so I sent him a picture of that and a couple other small things. Um, and also the snail was part of a larger piece I did that I sent in to the character carvers um, competition last year. And so they came back and said, oh, this is really great. We'd like to do a little booklet. Um, and we want these four or five. They had my shrimpy and they had the, the bear. Uh, so we wanted, and they gave me two and a half weeks to get them done, uh, which was not very nice. <laughs> Um, because I was also in school and that's not a lot of time. So I, I got it into them. Uh, they're like, great, this is awesome. Thank you so much. And that was that. And then I got an email a couple months later and they said, Hey, we're going to put your bear in the, what, spring, spring issue of Wood Carving Illustrated. Um, and then about a month after that, I got another email and they asked for another project. Um, and that's what I spent the last maybe five months working on. Uh, so it kind of snowballed very quickly. But if you have something that you want to send into them, um, they're really good to work with. And if it's even if it's simple, but it's different, um, that's usually what what they're looking for is is something different um, that appeals to a large number um, of various diverse group. Um, so I would say don't be afraid to send it in. The worst they can say is no, and then you have your carving. So, um, you know, put together a good email, take some really cute shots of it, you know, take it outside or put, set it up in a scene. Um, you know, not just a, a picture of it in your hand, but give it personality um, so that it, it kind of captures their attention. Um, mine was uh, the three or four penguins and I put them on a, a wood plaque and I had little um, the little craft Christmas trees because it was around Christmas and I covered it in the base I covered in polymer clay and made it look like snow uh, and I think that's what caught the attention is it was just something different. Thanks Sarah. <clears throat> to add to that one of the things if you're not following wood carving illustrated on um, Instagram, uh, you, you should be. And I know uh, I have a potential project coming up in the, the fall issue, I think. And uh, that's where they found it. Uh, I mean, they scanned through there and, and, and saw that project. And so I think that that might be a, a wise thing to do as well. Yep, they, they peruse social media for um, for little projects and things and a lot of times they'll contact you and say we really like this. Uh, that's actually what had happened was they were looking through my Instagram um, 
and then asked for some other projects. So I would follow them, get them to follow you back. Hey, Sarah, this yeah. is Dave. Hi, Dave. Thank, thanks a lot for doing this, man. You, you're just doing a great job. Oh, thanks, Dave. And uh, I have a question for you about the projects you're working on with the, with the wire legs. How do you, do you leave them as they are or are you gonna paint them or build them up in some way? Um, so um, this one, I'm just gonna leave them as is because it's kind of a gold color, uh, mixed between a gold and a copper color. Um, some of them I'll paint. I've uh, toyed with the idea of painting the legs on the flamingo because right now it's kind of a brownish. But yeah, um, I like wire because I think mixing media, um, you know, wire, craft wire and wood, you, you wouldn't normally expect them to go together, but it just adds a little bit of character and dimension. Um, the first one was that balloon. So I, I thought, oh, that'd be really cute to put a balloon in his hand. And I did and it kind of caught, but yeah, um, you, can, you can paint it. You could probably, um, before you applied it, I could probably take that out and spray paint the wire. Um, if it's not going to be handled, obviously it would scratch off if you're going to play with it. And my daughter does play with a lot of the carvings to my dismay, but I can't fault her. So yeah, it's really versatile. You can also get wire in different colors, which is cool. That's fun. Thank you. And very Sarah. Did anybody catch that? It kind of cut out. No, I didn't. It was it very all. informative. Oh, thank you. So no, this is. I mean, this is carving should be extremely fun. Uh, embrace your failures because that is the best way to learn. I've had a couple. I obviously don't post them. It was my own learning experience, so I don't need to publicly flog myself. Um, but yeah, embrace the failures. If you do something you don't like, uh, if you paint something that you don't like, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've taken a <coughs> knife to my painting and carved off the paint and painted it again. Not the best way to go, but it works. Um, that's essentially the eraser of paint is to carve it off. I don't ever want to get rid of a project because usually anything I get to do has taken a long time to complete. I really only get, you know, 15, 20 minutes here and there um, to carve. And that's usually after my daughter's gone to bed uh, or right after an exam when I don't have to study. So I don't get a lot of time. So by the time I've finished a carving, um, I've invested quite a lot into it, so I'm going to make sure that I'm, I paint it with as much investment as I did in the carving, if that makes sense. So, you know, I, I spend quite a long time on the painting um, because I, for my own um, payoff, like I want to look at it and be like, you know, I, I did a good job. It's something, you know, I, I don't always tell myself good job, but with carving, this is the first time, you know, where I finish something and I think, you know, I'm proud of myself for that. Not in a pompous way, but, um, you know, I've, I've put in a lot of time to learn. And so I want that to be reflected in my carves. Um, if that makes sense. So. Yes. Yeah. I think Anybody if I was else? to learn from my mistakes in carving, I'd probably be the best carver in the world. Or I should be the best carver in the world. <laughs> yeah. You and the rest of us. <laughs> Hey Sarah, on the the finish, uh, I use the matte finish also with the Howard's Feed and Wax on top of the, the matte. Kind of takes the the chalky look off of you know softens them up on the colors. So I don't know if that's what you do, but you know that's something I've come to. I, I stay away from the the boil linseed oil because it seems like it ages your skin tones and they darken up. You know over time. Um, and on the ones that you've noticed, it does that. Like what, um, what time frame? I, does that make sense? Like how, at what point do they start to darken? I'm just curious. Years. It takes a few years because I have a few Pete LeClairs that, you know, I've gotten from him 
and they're almost, you know, almost like a colored person now <laughs> from the just okay. regular skin tone. But I've found with using the matte finish with the Howards helps keep the, you know, the colors bright and they don't seem to fade at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't know. Does I mean, anybody, I, Has anybody I, ever cut the bold linseed oil to maybe take away some of that? Well, I think it's adding the burnt umber to the oil, which creates that, you know, that you want to give it that antiquing part. Just a straight boil in seed may work because it's clear. I'm going to try that. Did you learn that from Pete LeClaire? Uh, There's one of his ways of doing it just from back to beginning, but it's just kind of, for boil in seed, I just don't like the smell of it. It just, you know, it just to me, it stinks and it just stays. So I found something that just kind of when you're done with it, you're done with it. Plus, the Howard's has that citrus smell to it, which is, you know, pretty good. Well, if, if I understand Sarah correctly, and I think she does it the exact same way that I do it, is she uses the boiled linseed oil before she paints, then she finishes with the Krylon, and then she waxes it with the Howard Feeding Wax. Ah. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes. Right. So the boiled linseed oil is doing something different than the pylon and the wax. Yeah, it may break the paint down and soften the paint more. I've not tried that, like using it before. Yeah, Plus so I kind of use it like a primer. And so it's okay. underneath all of the paint. So I'm wondering, and I haven't been carving long enough to even know, does that, and maybe some of the things I'm doing now will mm -hmm. show in a couple of years and so <laughs> it will be something I change but um yeah so it's under the under the paint and then it's sealed after that so I don't know I may try that because the purpose in it is to give it an antique old kind of look anyway so right. it may just add to it hey, Dana, you guys, on the spot, but can you speak to that a little bit I I didn't hear say that again I said, I don't want to put Dave Stetson on the spot, but I know he uses uh, boiled linseed oil in the beginning. Can you speak to that a little bit, Dave? Um, I'd, I'd just throw my two cents worth at you. Um, Michelle is who I learned to paint from. And using the boiled linseed oil is something that we found a carving at Ingler's studio in Branson that it just knocked us off our feet with, with the way the flesh tones looked. And Pete and Mary didn't want to tell us what they did and, you know, him hot around. And after a while, we found out from one of the gals that did some painting for them that they kind of got screwed up because they used to paint everything right on the bare wood with the acrylics. And then they'd come back and linseed oil over it. Mm -hmm. Somebody helping them out had thrown the linseed oil on first. And we really liked the way it looked, but I don't know, because we, we ended up purchasing the carving, brought it home, and when Michelle would go to dust, there'd be a little puddle of oil on the shelf underneath it. And mm -hmm. after six months, I mean, she used to have to fold up paper towels and put them under it. But mm -hmm. uh, when we started using the boiled linseed oil, she would go to the art supply store and buy artist boil linseed oil, which evidently is different than the boil linseed oil that you get from the hardware store. And it's one of those things where you get what you pay for. So she'd get a little can and pay $9 for it. And I go to the hardware store and pay two fifty dollars for a gallon. And, and I was just using the hardware store variety. But it was hard to travel and haul around a gallon can of boil linseed oil. So I would use her discarded cans and refill them <laughs> with the with the hardware variety and because it was just easier to transport it around and one day she happened to grab one of the cans that i had refilled and put it on her carving and she couldn't tell the difference um but i do have some pieces that have been sitting around for five or six or ten or twenty years 
and they do darken with time. Yes. Uh, and they do kind of look antiqueish. If you've been, if you've ever gone to a garage sale and found an old carving that's sitting around and how dark the wood seems to look, uh, that's what you get in time from the boil linseed oil. I would like to think that the artist variety linseed oil is refined in some way that it uh, it stays a, a clearer, uh, doesn't react it the same way with the wood as the hardware store variety. Could be the reason for the cost difference, but I couldn't swear by it, but that's, that's just my two cents worth. Dave, have you had experience with using the artist grade on carvings and finding that they don't darken? I, I would like to say I could tell you the answer to that, but I don't have any of those carvings still sitting around. Those were, oh. those are primarily Michelle Santa's and, and she sold damn near every one she ever carved. So oh. I now the boy I don't have anything to compare it to. Oh, okay. Now the boiled linseed oil that you've used, that was just straight linseed oil, not, not tinted with anything. Yeah, no, I don't tint it. Okay. There, there's difference, there's differences with linseed oils. There's your straight linseed, walnut, and tongue are all natural oils. You can use them on spools and such because they're food safe, polymerized, and hard inside. But the boiled linseed oil that everybody buying has a bunch of um, chemical added to it so that it will um, dry faster. And it's like that's not food safe. And that might be where the, the tinting coming in because it's not pure anymore. It's really hard to get hands on pure seed oil. You almost have to order it. So what you were talking about, what Michelle used, may have been you know, a, a better good closer to pure versus in chemical, if that makes sense. Yeah, if I were you, John, I wouldn't keep putting the carvings in your mouth any longer. <laughs> yeah, this is breaking up. I was I was trying to show this one. This was this was still overnight in linseed oil until it couldn't take any more. Then it was hung by for weeks in the garage. And when it come out, it's pretty nice. Three years later, it's almost black. There was no anything. It was just great BLO in a one one pickle jar. And the more it goes, the darker it gets. And like I said, I'm not sure if that's the, the chemical BL or not. The, it, the chemicals in there. Hey, so do you guys think that, or has anybody ever considered putting trans tint mixed in with your linseed oil? Everybody's never heard of it. Oil. Yeah, it's something that I saw at the Woodcraft stores, like some of the powdered, uh, do your own stain kind of stuff. So I was just, I was just messing around in the basement, just trying different stuff on scrap. So I'll find something, see if I can post it in the group, just so you can I, see what it looks like. I mean, I'm still mixing it up to figure out lightness and darkness, how much is too much, because again, you are using a powder, and you're like Doctor Evil, you know, in a wood shop, you know, mixing it up. So. I've used it on the dry, on the, I've used trans tents on bowls that I've, I've turned and, uh, and then oil them after I put the trans tent on, but I haven't mixed it with the oil. Okay. I know. Guys, just to put a different spin on things, um, <laughs> I uh, use or linseed oil now, now after um, contacting Sarah because I was unsure a few months ago so thanks for that Sarah and also I watched your videos recently Dave so I've picked up on the fact that it gets darker and the grades you use and stuff but uh, traditionally um, when I was sealing my carvings I learned from um, some Czech puppet makers some marionette carvers and when they paint their, their carvings or their puppets they seal their their wood first or their linden or their lime first with um, a mixture of water, uh, white 
paint and white craft glue, really small amounts of the paint and the craft glue until it makes like a really thin white emulsion, almost like the consistency of like, I don't know, 2% milk or something like that. Really, 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 really washed out milk. And they paint that over it before they go over that with the acrylics instead of using white linseed oil. So it's just so it's just putting a spin on it, just something else I learned to kind of pass on to you guys really and see if you're interested and so on. Will you send me that what the concoction you just mentioned? Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll, I'll post a message across to you or something. It's it's fairly straightforward to they used to the guy that um taught me really old um uh traditional marionette carver he used to just like have old jars of it knocking around covered in sawdust and just take the lid off and then like he was really secretive to kind of let anyone know what was in it he just called it a sealer but then I went back like four years in the trot for for a month at a time so in the end I broke him down and he told me what was in it and it wasn't much in it at all to be honest it was just paint and craft glue. Rich that sounds like a gesso yeah, it's it's kind of similar to a jet. So I think it's like probably they they the, they made it themselves or something. Because um, I used I used to use gesso when I did my paintings and stuff in art school, and um, and it's not it, it's it's got a similar kind of feel to it. But if you do it super translucent, so like a tiny amount of literally like a drop of of white paint, a drop of craft glue, and then some some water and mix it through. So it's very 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 thin. You could you can barely see the white. Um, it still leaves it quite translucent on the wood, so it doesn't discolor it or or change the, the natural color of the lime or the linden or basswood or whatever. Um, and then you, it actually adheres the paint quite good to it afterwards. But but before he paints on top of his, or, or on top of the marionettes, which, which I was taught, he uses like a foam sanding pad with like a 600 grit, um, foam sanding pad to lightly key the surface ever so slightly and then the, the sealing helps bond the paint I guess with the sanding as well. So Rich is he painting with acrylics or oils? With acrylics uh, and then he just uses um, for the white they use household emulsion um, because it's flat and it doesn't it, it they said there's something to do with reflecting the light when you do a puppet show so they use like white household emulsion, water-based. But then the rest of the colors are just like crafters acrylics or, or artist acrylics, you know. Are you in England? I'm in Wales, which is bolted on the side of England. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's quite dark here. Well, it's nine o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Rich, when they uh, when they paint the acrylics on, is that watered down acrylics? I didn't catch that, or is it just straight acrylic? Yeah, when um, I, I'd show you guys an example of my, I've got a devil I made when I was studying in Prague, and um, I painted it using their techniques, but unfortunately, it's down, it's it's in another room down at the bottom of the house, um, so I can't grab it at the moment. But um, when they they mix their, their paints, they they water their paints down. And they use, usually use acrylic paints for the colors, but if they're doing white, they use household like emulsion, just normal white water-based household emulsion for walls, because um, it's flatter. Uh, so it does it, so it helps reflect the light or something in stage shows when you do puppet shows and things. But then on on the one I did, we we run out of um, red paint when I was in the middle of painting my devil red. So rather than go into the uh, store to get more paint, he just grabbed like a, a, a bottle of red ink off the, off the shelf and poured water-based red ink into my mixture. And then I ended up using that and that worked just as well as well. So yeah, there was some, there was some quirky different ways of working with things, you know. Um, hey, we got time if you want to run downstairs and grab that carving. Um, okay. Yeah, we're not oh, wait. So while we're waiting, does anybody else have any questions for Sarah? Um, we want to say thank you for Sarah for taking the time today to uh, put this presentation together. And I know it took a lot of extra work and stuff to make sure that the technology and stuff. 
Uh, thanks again, Sarah, for agreeing. I know you were kind of voluntold. Everybody kind of voted unanimously. Yeah, that wasn't fair. Look, I had like a four-year-old toddler meltdown, you know, <laughs> so that was a little bit shysty. I didn't even yeah, get to we, be here for the vote. Well, we that's what you get to leave in the meeting early. Yeah, I guess so. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> hey, Sarah, this is Joe. I've got a question for you. Um, it's a painting question, and it's not really a carving related, but it's related to your rocks. Yeah. Um, how do you get the 3D look on those paintings? Which one do you, are you talking about Olaf? Yes. So, um, um, all right, well. <laughs> Sorry if it's a tough question. Well, I got session. a four-year-old who's dying to get one. There's, um, there's two things on rocks. Um, one is just knowing how to do the shadow. Um, and so let me see if I can find a picture of Olaf really quick. So when you're painting and it's those little things that when you look at it, you don't realize it's a detail that's there. Does that make sense? Um, you have to, I think, train yourself to see the little details that normally your eye just takes in and you don't you don't realize that there's a difference. Olaf, um, when you're looking at him straight on, what you might not realize is that there's a shadow under his nose to make the carrot look like it's coming off the rock. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to pull up a picture. Um, Okay, so it's it's extremely subtle, and I hope you can see it. Underneath his nose, there is the slightest shadow on the white. So there's a gray shadow underneath the white. Your eye automatically sees it and puts it together so you wouldn't know that it's there. And then underneath his nose on the carrot, you have that blending of a very dark orange so yeah. that's what I was talking about with the peaks and valleys. You have a very light, almost white on the top of the nose and you have a very, very dark orange underneath the nose. So understanding where, you know, as the, no the, the carrot curves under is where you're going to put that darkest color and then that little line of gray underneath it so that it, it looks 3D. It's very hard to get you know, a carrot on a flat surface to look like it's coming out at you, right? Right, right. So as you, and this is what I found on Pinterest. Like I said, I, Pinterest is awesome because it's a whole lot of stuff in one spot. So if you Google or you search Olaf in Pinterest, it will come up with a bunch of different images. And then um, you really just have to learn to look for the shadows and the highlights, low lights and highlights. And that's where you get the dimension to make it look 3D or whatever. And then I seal the rocks with art resin, which um, enhances the paint on a rock. I don't know why, it's ridiculous, um, but just a, you know, a not very expensive art resin um, makes the paint pop. So I don't know if you're going to paint rocks, but if you're just asking about the 3D, it's learning how to see, you have to train your eye to see the highlights and low lights and to pick them out from each other. And that takes time. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Sarah, I wanna follow you on Pinterest. See what kind of stuff you're saving. <laughs> I save fun stuff on Pinterest. My boards are awesome. Pinterest is such a cool tool um, when, when I was, uh, much younger, they always, uh, encourage us to start what they call the morgue, which is just a file full of clips and pictures and things that for reference that you could go back to. And now it's, it's all on our phone. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable where we're at. It's, it's an amazing tool. Um, Pinterest has really, um, I think for art or you know, whatever else. And you see kind of the funny uh, memes or whatever about like Pinterest fails. You know, everybody tries to recreate what they saw on Pinterest and they put their, you know, catastrophic nightmare next to the picture that they saw on Pinterest. And 
Um, but it, it's a great place to go for, you know, if you really want to carve, in fact, my bug, the bug was um, concept art that I saw and I thought, oh, that would make a really cute carving. And so I have, you know, just that picture. And one of the funnest things to me is to see a cartoon, a character or someone's doodle and say, oh my gosh, that would make an adorable carving. So I get asked a lot, you know, where do you get your inspiration? Well, I peruse the cartoons on Pinterest. I find a cute or even two. Um, I did a, a project. I had to do um, like a troll type and, you know, <laughs> I don't just have trolls in my noggin. I mean, so I went and I Googled uh, on Pinterest. I, I found, you know, trolls and, and other type of mythical creatures. And, you know, you can take eyes from one cartoon and the head shape from one cartoon and you, you marry those <coughs> together to create something that, you know, that's super fun. And so concept art, um, things, character design, Pinterest is a great place because you have a lot of different artists. You can kind of pick and choose, you know, which uh, features you want to take and put it into a carving. So that's, I think, one of my favorite parts of carving is taking, you know, someone else's concept and turning it into my carving. You know, I'm not copying their drawing, but I've taken inspiration just to create something really fun in a, in a 3D version. All right, Rich, what do you got for us? Okay, here we go. The lighting is terrible in this room, by the way, so apologies in advance. Well, okay, so he's he's a Czech uh, a Czech devil. I don't know how much you guys can see of it, um, but it's uh, Rich, all articulated. Rich, um, I have your website open, and I can yeah. open that picture and share the screen. Oh, great. Is it there? Yeah, that's a, yeah, yeah, that's a much clearer picture. So, so we went quite muted and quite like dark blood red. There's a little picture above it, just above the, the tutor Merrick. That's the one there. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can see the colors on it, on it there. And then a trick that he showed me to make it look like uh, we talk, you guys talking about the highlights and things um, was was basically taking some sandpaper once it was all finished and uh, and then sanding back and uh, and exposing some of the the wood underneath it uh, and then and then put a yellow wash over the top to make it look like uh, make it look like it's almost glowing like the embers in fire um, which I do have on on him, you can kind of see her on the chest and things on on here, and so on. Um, yeah, that's what that's. And then to finish it, they then just painted uh, painted PVA glue or, or white craft glue watered down over the top of it as a sealer. But then when I came home, I sprayed it with a satin seal, acrylic satin sealer myself, just to make it a bit more hard wearing. Um, I have one of Ludic, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Ludic Burian. Yeah, do you have one of his whales? Yeah, I've got, I've got one of his. Um, he did He's one amazing. for me and uh, he, he uses all kinds of medium on it. There's acrylic paint, oil paint, colored pencil. Uh, yeah. You can see where he's, you know, sanded the paint back. I mean, it's not just, you know, applying acrylic paint. They really know how to... Um, kind of combine mediums and I love that he has uh, like a colored pencil it, it's a pencil mark I don't know if they're just colored pencil but yeah um, after he's painted it he applies and uses some colored pencil to really give it um, even more depth and and stuff so yeah I love those but I'm, I was super stoked that he did one for me I was excited yeah yeah he's awesome he's awesome hey, thanks for sharing that rich no problem at all. I finished, just in case anybody knew that. Uh, uh, uh. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Yeah, that was great, Sarah. Will, uh, will you post pictures of that on your side as well as the International Woodcover site? I will. Um, and I've almost got 
Sorry, I was multitasking, but I'll get his beak and sunglasses painted up and I dry brushed him while we were talking. So I'll post some more pictures of that one. But it's super, super simple. Like I said, you know, painting doesn't have, it, it really is in the very small details. You just do, you know, those little things a little extra and, you know, you really make your carving pop. So I don't know if any of that helped. If you have questions, you can message me. Um, yeah, this was super fun. I love this forum. I think it's a great place for us to just get together and, you know, chit chat. Keep the breeze. All right. Well, if uh, anybody else has questions for Sarah, go ahead and ask them now. Uh, Sarah, there's a lot of uh, thank you notices over in the chat section, so you may want to go down and check those out. I won't go through the process of reading all those, but I'll go look at them. Um, thank you all. I mean, that really means appreciate your time. Thank, thank you, much. Sarah. Um, just so you all know, we had about 57 people on the um, on the chat today, so that's a record so far for us. Uh, I see Tom's joined us now. Tom, you want to add anything? No, I just want to say thanks, Sarah. That's been a, you did an amazing job today. Thanks. Um, so we'd like for you all to share this with other people. We're trying to create a forum again where everybody can kind of join in. Uh, we hope to have new speakers every week, uh, new information. Again, just an opportunity to share with each other and learn from each other. Uh, we'll do this again next uh, Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll post the number, the right number. And again, I apologize for those of you who saw my post, which was wrong. Um, and we'll make sure that the number's right going forward. Um, and if you have any suggestions on topics, please feel free to send it to me or Tom and we'll see if we can help that out. And again, we just appreciate you taking your time uh, joining us today. And again, we'll see you all next Saturday. Thank you. We did record this. Uh, Thank you. So once we figure out how to upload it, uh, then that, that will be available through the Is that right, Blake? Yeah, that's right. Well, I plan on uploading it to uh, to YouTube so that we can go back and read it. And I think that's all for us today. So again, thanks for joining us. And we'll see you on Saturday. Thanks, guys. It was great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye, Cheers. Take care. Thanks. Bye. See you guys. See you, girl.